What's up, everybody? Troy Cartwright here. Welcome back to 10 Year Town. In two weeks, we're going to be doing another Q&A episode. So if you've got a question for me or for producer Ben um, about, I don't know, how the music industry works, how publishing works, how songwriting works, whatever you want to know, we'll try and answer it. Submit those questions at 10yeartown.com. Today's guest is the legendary Jody Williams. Jody Williams has a 40 plus year career as a songwriter champion. He has been a publisher and an executive for many years over at BMI. He is currently at the helm of his company, Jody Williams Songs. And in this episode, we talk about the future of songwriting. Um, We talk about what publishers are looking for in new songwriters and um, he just provides a lot of insight and cool stories from his journey along the way i am so honored to have him on this podcast this week and uh, i know you guys are gonna love this episode so without further ado here he is jody williams well i always start this thing off um with the same question which is how long have you been in town i have been in town my entire life i was born and raised here wow yeah. Um, did you grow up like in Nashville, Nashville? I grew up in Nashville, Nashville. Okay. Um, Probably a little different. Yeah. It's, it's, now it is. It's, it certainly has evolved, but still yeah. love it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's funny how much I just started coming here. My best friend went to college here. So first time I came to Nashville was probably 2008. Mm-hmm. Even since then, it's oh changed gosh. a ton. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's insane. Um, well, I was doing a little bit of homework today, so I'm going to tell you a version of your history, and then you can just tell me what I missed and where I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So you started in the mailroom at BMI. Correct. And then you went to go, you went into publishing somewhere. Is that right? After that? Yes. And then you went back to BMI? Yes. As like a writer creative Worked with, yeah. kind of helped sign writers to BMI. Yeah, was a writer rep. Okay. And then you went uh, to MCA after yes, that? Yes, correct. And then that got bought. Mm-hmm. And then you started Jody Williams Publishing. Music. Music, sorry. Yeah. yeah. And then did you sell it and then go back to BMI? Is that kind of how that I went? I went back to BMI and, and sold it right after I went back to BMI. Okay. And then was it BMI? That's when I met you and you were That's, there for uh, what, 15 years or so? Almost 14 years. Okay. And then now you're, you're back in, in the publishing. Right. Right. That's pretty good. Pretty Troy. good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You missed a couple of stops in there. I, yeah. worked, I worked at some other, uh, from the mailroom at BMI, I went to work for Charlie Daniels, okay. which was really a management company with a desk drawer publishing company. So they were just so, kind of publishing his songs. They were publishing his songs that he recorded. Gotcha. They didn't want to sign any writers. Yeah. But mainly it was a concert production company, Sound 70 Productions. Okay. And the same guy that owned that, Joe Sullivan, uh, managed Charlie and some other acts too. Okay. So I was, the, the cool thing about that was I, being around a management company with an act that was breaking regionally into national you know, stardom. It was great. He was, yeah. I mean, he, he Devil Went Down to Georgia was a pop hit. Really? As well as a country hit. Wow. So he was he was exploding all over the place. Did you um I guess let's let's go back like a, even a little bit further than that. So did you always know that music was, you know, something that you wanted to be involved with? Yes. Absolutely. From from the time I was in maybe fourth or fifth grade. Okay. Um, I was just, you know, I'm I'm that generation that saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, and that yeah. th- same story th- that a zillion other people have. Well, that that's that's part of my story too. And yeah. I just knew from then I wanted to be in a band. I always really wanted to play guitar in a band and write songs as I got older. Yeah. And um, I went to one year of college at the University of Denver, and then stayed out there and worked in a record store uh, yeah. for another year. And decided I wanted to come back and um, have a record store. So I came back, and my dad was very entrepreneurial, and he was going to help me do it. Yeah. 
and he sent me to talk with Frances Preston, who is the legendary lady that that started the BMI office here. Yeah. And I went to school with her kids, went to high school with her kids. So I just knew her as Miss Preston. I didn't I didn't think she was like some big wig person yeah. that I should be, you know, right. in awe of or anything. Yeah. She was just the mother of David and Donnie, you yeah. know. So I go see her. My dad said, you know, um, she knows all about the music business and you should just, since you know her, just go talk to her and see what she says about what your ideas are. Yeah. And she said, um, well, we're about to go into a recession and people aren't going to buy retail, anything other than food and gas, Yeah. you know, and it'd be a really not a great time to start a business. So why don't you intern here and we'll pay, well, you can be a paid intern. Yeah. And I was like, this is not what I wanted to hear, you know, at all. Yeah. But I really had no choice. I had nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, I'll do, I just thought I'll do this for as long as it's fun, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, it took me a, a few years, you know, went by before I figured out that that was a whole setup that my dad did. Oh, you know, really? It was a complete setup. <laughs> And um, I don't think he wanted to fund <laughs> a record store uh, at all. Yeah. And so anyway, I go to work for BMI and, uh, you know, it was, it was, um, this was 1976. Yeah. And so it was, I did, you know, I learned quickly what BMI was. BMI was the place that paid all the songwriters their royalties when they had hits on the radio. Yeah. And they, you know, they collect money from the users of music, primarily radio, TV, and, uh, you know, bars and restaurants. Yeah. And so all the records that I've been selling at the record store in Denver, all these, all these artists like, you know, Jimmy Buffett and um, Asleep at the Wheel and Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings were all coming in to the office to get advance checks from, from Francis Preston and you know, oh, kiss the ring and yeah, get their check. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I thought, God, I'm, you know, I'm around these guys. I mean, I was just the, I was nobody, yeah. but I was like, I was selling their records. And then I was seeing this business side of here they are coming into this place that I just got a job at. And, and this is fascinating. And so I really, I'd always studied um, who, who wrote the songs. I mean, that always really interested me. And I always wondered, you know, just reading the liner notes and all that type of thing. Yeah. Um, so I did that for about a year. Um, and at the same time, I was still writing songs and still wanting to play guitar. I was playing in people's bands and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but I really just wanted to write songs myself. And then um, Del Bryant, who was a writer rep, sort of the senior writer rep at that time, whose parents are Boudlow and Felice Bryant, who wrote Rocky Top. and Okay. You know, all I have to do is dream and all these giant 50s hits yeah. and 60s hits. Del, um, Del said, come back and come to my office and let's let's listen to some of my parents' songs and you tell me who ought to record them. And I thought, okay. And that was like a game, you know? Yeah. And, and then, you know, I quickly learned, oh, this is a job at a publishing company. People cast songs and they pitch songs to the artists that, you know, where they fit. Yeah. And so I quickly got in, in you know... BMI represents writers and publishers, and I was sort of seeing all the back office money flow, how all that happened, mm. and who owned what, and how the streams of income, you know, interacted with each other. Yeah, and it just became fascinating to me. And then the other, the other part, part of it was I was around some really good writers and singers at that time that were coming up, and I was not that good. I mean, it was a hobby to me, mm-hmm. and most most successful writers or musicians um, that we all know have to do it. Like you can't, if you have to, if a song gets in your head, guess what? You're yeah. stopping what you're doing and you're going to go do that because that's the way you're wired. Right. And I'm not wired that way. Gotcha. I, I, can, I could not do it, okay. but I love doing it. You know, it's a hobby. It's just a serious hobby. Yeah. And then, but so I learned that publishers are these people that walk alongside people like you. Yeah. And, help them connect the dots to create an income stream with your music. Yeah. And I have never turned back. I mean, I just, that was my, I have a, a somewhat of a head for business, enough of a head for business to where that really interested me. Yeah. Um, and I still get to hang out with songwriters, which is a joy to me. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I had, a, I had a guitar teacher growing up and he said, um, he said, Troy, if you can do anything else, you should do that. <laughs> I tell people that weekly. Yeah. Oh yeah. But I can't for me, like I'm, you know, I'll be watching a movie with my wife and I'm like, got to pause it. I got to write this down. Yeah. You know, I got to figure out what this is real quick. <laughs> well, thank God for people like you. Cause we all need that. Cause we can't do that. <laughs> You know, and uh, it, it makes your life so much more enjoyable to when you, when you have all that music, it's just great. Um, I think, uh, I think you really touched on something that's, that is something that I don't know, maybe we don't talk about enough, but it's like the, what creative people need the most is, is a champion. Mm -hmm. And that's what for songwriters, that's what, you know, publishers do for us and that's, that's right. what you know bmi helps us out a ton mm -hmm. and that way the pros do but um you know without i remember my first publisher was um allison junker yeah and i just remember when she i talked to a few publishers and i remember sitting i was sitting in an airport at dallas love field and she called me in the morning and just said i want you to sign with me and it was like oh my god Somebody believes in me. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody Huge. believes in me and wants to give me money. Yeah. You know, I couldn't believe it, but that, that changed my life. Oh, sure. Um, you know, and I, I think publishers are, get to be that call for a lot of people that for their first, you know, the first person to believe in them. Yeah. Um, or one of the first people. And it's, it's so special. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's very special. And, and that sort of starts a chain reaction. You know, a guy like you needs that sort of continually in his career. Yes. There, there are times when it's not a good day or it's not a good season and you yeah. got to have, and, and then one person comes along and can change that for you. Yeah. They're Just like, by your, saying the right thing, it's, you know, pretty amazing. Yeah. They're like your, your guides. It's yeah. uh, to me, it's almost, um, magical in a way yeah these people enter your life at exactly the right moment mm -hmm. you know and i don't know if that's if that's god or if that's you know the muse just figuring out you know that you need a little help today yeah. but um it's really it's really special so um i know you uh a lot of i, I know that you've been that for a lot of people um that kind of guiding light that they need so yeah it's a, it's a privilege i mean it's it's not and it's you know this business is so subjective mm. it's like our our company is completely subjective i mean we don't come to work trying to make money yeah that's just we just if you did that we could all go make more money doing anything else than this <laughs> i promise you yeah but we come to work with a focus on really good songs mm. and encouraging sort of keeping that healthy playground where the writers are encouraged to to really write something different and not not try to chase the market and be meaningful and yeah. that doesn't mean every song has to be a serious ballad you know that makes you cry but we wish but, it could be <laughs> but, but we, a little more of that might be good but um no it's it's just all about really you know good copyrights you know songs that can really earn money for a long 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 time yeah yeah and um yeah, you've you've been a part of a few of those yeah. over over time. Um on the publishing side, what do you I there's I got so many different questions for you, but um just because you were kind of talking about the history of your career and that just kind of for me ties into like the way that money flows and publishing works and BMI works. So um I think I spend a lot of time, you know with my other songwriting buddies and publisher friends, like being worried about like the, um, you know, the future of songwriting. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, um, are we going to be okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, these days that's a loaded question. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty bullish on it's going to be okay. I think it's all going to be okay. Well, it always was okay. It never, yeah. it never was great for songwriters and publishers. Mm. Uh, when streaming came in, you know, songwriters and publishers, you know, the record companies make 15 times more than the writers and publishers make. And 
Will that change over time? You know, we hope so. I mean, we're making inroads every year. Yeah. And and things are things are not getting worse every year, but there's a new challenge every year. Yeah. So it just it sort of feels like we're not moving the needle hardly at all. Yeah. But uh, you know, uh, the, the PROs and the NMPA and there's a lot of really smart people in SAI. Yeah. You know, they're really fighting the good fight, and I really think we're in every room we need to be in to convince people you know, to, to bring the rates up for songwriters and publishers. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good. Um, perspective, right? Like yeah. it's always, it's always been okay. <laughs> it's always, so. you know, in, in our market, it's like, um, I can't, I can't have a successful or what would be a financially successful publishing company without radio hits. Mm-hmm. Cause that's still where all the big money is. I mean, you can have, you know, 50 million streams, yeah. And and it's it's just not a whole lot of money. Right. Uh, on the writer publisher side. In comparison, in comparison to the master. To the master. So um you know, we're we're trying to we're we're so so my company and a lot of other publishing companies are are releasing our own masters. Yeah. We're sort of acting as sort of the de facto pub, de facto record company until Warner Brothers Records would call and say, we want to sign your artist and take them to radio. Yeah. Because that's something that's too expensive for us to do. But we found that it's not too expensive for us to record music, release it to the DSPs, hire a digital marketing person, hire a photographer, and yeah. do all the glam and do all the stuff to get a project ready. You know, help them find a producer, help them find the managers. Yeah. And then we hope we can, you know, tell a story over – a, you know, a sh- relatively short period of time to where somebody would want to sign yeah. the writer artist. Yeah. It's artist, artist development. It's just artist development. Yeah. Which is like, um, you know, it, artist development feels like the wild west right now. Mm-hmm. There's people doing it independently. You know, I feel like publishers are sort of stepping into this role as well. And, and, and labels are too. I mean, I think everybody's trying, it's just hard to, um, it's hard to know what the right, the game is changing every, every day. Well, you know what? I, 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 our staff, we, we talk about this all the time. Like today, the target is right there. It's right there. Yeah. And we're going to walk in tomorrow morning and we're going to look right there and the target won't be there anymore. It's, it's going to be, gone. be, it's going to be over there. And that's the way it feels every day. Cause there's not one right way to do it. Mm-hmm. There's, there's maybe 20. Yeah. And you, you just have to take your best shot, you know, and and learn from your mistakes and try not to spend too much money. Yeah. Keep going, I guess, yeah. you know. We talked about earlier you've been a part of a lot of really successful copyrights over the years. Mm-hmm. When you started working with someone like Liz Rose early on in, in her career, like is it one of those things where like you always knew? Or that it that it was like she was gonna like Liz Rose is a legend now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh Liz Rose when I met her, was a super sharp independent publisher. Okay. I didn't know her as a songwriter. Wow. She had a partner. They started a publishing company. They ran out of money. They sold the catalog. I had done a joint venture with Sony Publishing. Mm -hmm. So Sony bought, and and me, bought the catalog, 600 songs. Yeah. And then I hired Liz to continue to pitch the catalog for, I thought I'll, I'll hire, you know, for six months. So she can teach me the catalog and she can, you know, keep yeah. pitching them. Yeah. So I, once I started seeing the lyric sheets on my some of my favorite songs, her name was on them. So I'd ask the co-writer, I'd say, Kim, did it, why is Liz's name on this song? Yeah. And she said, well, she co-wrote it with me. And I said, oh, what about this one and this one and this one? Yeah, she co-wrote all those with me. So I, call, so I called Liz one day, or I saw her at the office, and I said, you wrote these songs. Why didn't you, why didn't you ever tell me that? These are really good songs. Yeah. Goes, oh, I didn't write them. I just do what publishers do. I just suggested a phrase change or a word change. It's, I didn't really, they're, they're not, I didn't write the songs. Yeah. And so I'd go back to Kim. I say, Kim, Kim Patton Johnson was the, the writer that wrote most, most the, mostly with Liz back then. And Kim said, no, she is legit writing half the song. So yeah. don't, don't listen, don't to her. listen to her. <laughs> and so I, uh, I, 
I said, Liz, you know, after after about six months, I said, Liz, I'm gonna let's let's sign you as a I'm gonna sign you as a writer. Yeah. And um and you can stop pitching the catalog. I I know the good songs now, so we're good with that. So I'll I'll pay you, you know, twice as much to write songs as I was paying her next to nothing, by the way. So <laughs> paying her twice as much was not that big of a stretch. Yeah. So uh, I paid her more money to write songs, and she did not want to do it. She she really? she found she, that was too risky for her. Like mm-hmm. me, depending, like I've got to write something that you get cut for me to to keep this job when I could be just pitching songs every day and keep the job for no telling how long. Yeah, that's the way she looked at it. And I said, I don't need you to do that anymore. So either take a job as a writer, or I guess you're gonna have to go find another job. Yeah, and and we we'd become friends too. I mean, she was she was awesome. She was like a member of the. She helped build the company really. Yeah. I mean, anytime I'd find a writer to sign, I'd say, Liz, write, write with this person and see if they're any good. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, um, no, it, it just it just started to work out. The, the thing that she did, she was, you know, she didn't play guitar. She wasn't a melody person. She, she could sing a melody, but she, that, she wasn't proficient just yet, I don't think, in that. She was a lyricist and a song idea person. Yeah. And she could sit with any writer and bring out bring out that idea like further than they thought yeah and keep it between the ditches yep and keep you know make make sure the second verse said something different and better than the first verse did yeah and she just she was a master craftsman that way still is yeah she's incredible and then then we just started getting cuts it was so it was like Patricia Yearwood and Tim McGraw and Gary Allen and you know just yeah. tons of people just started cutting their songs and um she had uh, there was a, an artist named Billy Gilman. Yeah, I remember and, Billy and, Gilman. And she that was her first big single. It was called Elizabeth, and she wrote it about her niece. And um, and then from there it was just sort of like I'd get you know I get a call from Bob DePiro's publisher. Well, the, the Liz, you know, but you know Bob DePiro wants to write with you, Liz. I think that's a good idea. Bob DePiro is kind of a big deal. Yeah, you know, that'd be a good thing for you to do. Good for the company. Yeah. And she goes, no, I don't, I, I just, I, she wouldn't write with any big writers because she still didn't think of herself as that person mm. who was going like this as a writer. Yeah. So she kept writing with all these developing, mainly young girls that, that would find her and want to write with her. And she had daughters that age. Yeah. And so it, it was just a natural, she was just like, she was just a, a wonderful friend to to all these you know aspiring artists that she was writing with, and then of course, one of those people is Taylor Swift, and yeah. Next thing you know, um, here's Taylor Swift like two or three days a week writing in our office, and her mother or father would be sitting in our little lobby while they wrote and wow. after school, and yeah, I'd go home about six o'clock, and they'd write till seven or eight at night really? on those days, wow, and and ended up writing. Like eight songs on the first record and Man. four on the second record. Yeah. Um, and that was at a time when the the industry was really unsure about Taylor. Mm-hmm. You know, like, is this really going to happen? There are no teenagers on the radio. And, yeah. you know, the music wasn't, um, it was just, there was just, no, there was nothing, it was so original and, and it hadn't been done in so long. I mean, it was, it's been since uh, like Leanne Rhymes you know, was that was younger than that when she yeah. had hits, but it had been, you know, years, decades since somebody had come along. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Pretty special though. Yeah. And Liz, you know, Liz, uh, all the credit to Liz for, for hearing it and seeing it and having the patience to work through all of the, you know, hours and hours of writing a ton of songs. Yeah. With Taylor at the beginning. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And Liz is, um, She's the best. She is. She's an amazing writer. And amazing person. Amazing person. I w- I've been on a couple of the Liz Rose writer retreats. Uh-huh. And it's just so fun. And she just, you know, it all, it's all her people. It's just such a good community, you know, all, all of her writers and all that stuff. And it's just, I don't know. It may, like, I always feel very at home there. Yeah. And that's super special. Well, when I started this company, I left BMI at the end of 2019. And Liz said, where are you going to office while you put your company together? And I said, 
I don't know, I've got my house or whatever. She said, well, t- I'll, I've got a writer's room you can have. So you come over and you can, you can like leave your house like you're going to work and come to my office. Yeah. And I took all my first meetings in there. at Liz Rose Music to sign the first five writers that we had. And, and then COVID, like I was there for two months and then yeah. COVID happened. Right. Yeah. Do you feel like, it seems like for a while, especially when I first started, pitching songs was getting really hard from the standpoint of a lot of songs were being written and cut by the artist themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems, and, and again, I don't know if this is true, but it just seems like in the last year or so, it's kind of opened up a little bit more and the, the, the pitch is becoming relevant again. Do these things tend to go in waves like that or? I, or? I don't, I don't see us going out of kind of the way, well, let me, let me back up. First yeah. of all, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, writers kept their own calendars. So all creative directors did was pitch songs mm-hmm. and they would meet other writers and they'd say, Hey, you know, um, Liz or Andy, you know, you need to write with so-and-so here's their number, call them and set up a write, you yeah. know? And that completely shifted in the last several years to where the creative managers are spending most of their time booking rights. Right. Um, and when we started the company, at, right at the beginning of the lockdown of COVID in 2020, nobody needed any songs because nobody was going into a studio, you know? Yeah. So we st- it was kind of cool because we started the company with no songs, five writers, and it, it kind of felt like the whole industry paused while we were pressed play and yeah, were building. just building up. Um, and then I guess it was about a year and a half ago about a year ago, the phone just started ringing off the hook from the A&R people all over town saying, we need songs. Yeah. You know, mainly because their, their writer artists had all they could do when they couldn't go on the road was write songs. And they wrote a lot of songs. Um, they wrote just a ton of songs. And I think, I think the A&R community said, let's, we really have to get some outside songs here Yeah, because some of these are okay. And some of them we can use, but most of them were not written with um, a lot of the, you know, the reason why Nashville is such a thriving music community with professional songwriters. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you have sort of built this career over time. Whatever you got, you got the, the special sauce, you know, that, that people, <laughs> people seem to want to work with it, <clears throat> with you. And what do you, what do you attribute that to? Do you think, you know, are, is it, is it all relationships? Is it something else? You know, I it I would say uh, you know a big chunk of it is just keeping great relationships. This community is so tight, and we all kind of know each other's business at the end of the business day. Yeah. And if you're doing if you're doing substandard business, everybody's going to know about it within about thirty days. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. And and you can't last. You can't have a career here if people are talking bad about you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so you know my my theory always was. Um, not that I really set out to do this, but I, I'm a, I love meeting people. Like meeting new songwriters is just, I just love it. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I, I can't wait to see who I meet this week that yeah. I haven't met before. It's awesome. And so you just want to keep a really positive attitude. You want to keep your door wide open because you never know who's going to change your world. Yeah. You know, and and, over, you know, if you've done it as long as I've done it, you have people calling you from 40 years ago or 35 years ago saying, you know, you were nice to me that one time and I'll never forget that. I mean, how many times have I heard that? Yeah. And anybody who's done this as long as I have and been in that seat, you know, that they can relate to that. But I'm I'm a, I'm generally a glass half full person. I'm yeah. very subjective about the music. I'm very opinionated about the music. And... That drives everything. And then if you keep your door open and know that some kid is really, that's who's, it's, it's, not, it's not some big time songwriter that you hook up one of your developing people with that's going to change your world. Mm-hmm. It's some kid yeah. who you give the first shot to that's going to change your world. Yeah. So if you'd stop doing that, your odds of success are just so much lower. Yeah. So I don't know. I just, I, I just tend to um, really enjoy people, meeting people, hearing their story. I mean, everybody's 
so unique. Um, and, you know, you want to find, you, you want to just encourage people to be different and yeah. write something different and don't be redundant. You know, if you like the way Troy Cartwright writes, don't write like him. Hmm. You know, take that and and be inspired by it. We've got, but be your own person. You know, say your own thing. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Well, and I, you know, a lot of our audience for this podcast is young songwriters, aspiring songwriters, or people that are thinking about moving to Nashville. Like, what kind of things are you specifically, or this can be like a general you? What kind of things do you think publishers are looking for? Well, yeah, for me, it's um, well. First of all, there there aren't very many writers moving to town that just write yeah. that don't want to be artists. That's okay, true. thirty years ago, not so much, half and half. Yeah, um, and now it's very rare to meet just a songwriter. Um, so if I meet a writer, a young writer who's a singer, usually they are. Is their voice unique enough? You know, mm-hmm. uh, is is the the lens by which they see the world and that that's the lyrical content of their songs. Is that so unique that, that nobody else is seeing it that way? And is it translatable to the public? You know, you think about stuff like that. Yeah. Um, we met Harper O'Neill. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've met Harper. I have. Yeah. Um, and she's, you know, she's an aspi- She's she's doing great. She's been opening up for Lainey Wilson and Ashley McBride on the road, and Amazing. she's she's kind of like a younger Bonnie Raitish type of, you know, bluesy Texas singer. Yeah, and a really fine songwriter. And she had just one of the most um, unique voices I'd ever heard. Yeah, and that's that's the thing that I was taken by. Plus, she could really play the guitar, like. She she's a guitar player. Yeah, she could really do it. So I thought, well, you sound that way, and you sing. You know, you can play. What are your songs like? And her songs were just. She had you know she kind of came up with uh, Meg McCree and Ben Chapman and that whole crew. Yeah. Um, primarily kind of right right before COVID, they'd all moved here together and lived in a house together. Yeah. And they were writing this unique. I mean, all, all of these, all, there's about eight of them. They all kind of played off of each other. And it was, she was just probably the next one that was abound to, you know, get somebody's attention. I'm just fortunate that I, yeah, I ran into her. Yeah. yeah. Cause you kept your door open. <laughs> I kept my door open and I, you know, it's sort of, it's funny. I found her on TikTok. Yeah. And, um, and I, I had, um, searched barbecue videos, golf videos, and female blues singers. That was my whole search, yeah. everything. Because everybody that, that had nothing to do but, be, you know, if they weren't on TikTok during COVID, they probably got on TikTok just to try it out because <laughs> they didn't have anything else to do. Yeah. So there she was. She popped up. And I thought, well, she probably lives in Australia, you know. <laughs> no, she lives in the nations. She was in the office two days later. You would call two people and, you know. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is, it is interesting, um, how people, I don't know how it works, but everybody, you kind of come in, you start writing in Nashville and you do, you kind of find your, your crew, Mm -hmm. you're just group of people that you write with. And then I don't know, somehow that codifies and solidifies over time. And then, and then like today I wrote with somebody that's like not in the crew, but is adjacent it's like the class above us sort of right and so we have a camaraderie in some weird way that i don't know i can't really explain how it all works it sort of feels like high school but (laughs) it's exactly like high school and it have it'll continue to happen that way here yeah yeah and what the way i um to the writers who are really talented if i meet them early on yeah but it's too early to sign them yeah but i you know that's Spark is there, like the right thing is there. Yeah. I just say go find your tribe. You yeah. know, don't don't think you've got to go write with Liz Rose. Cause she's not gonna want to write with you right now. I promise you. Yeah. You know, don't don't do that just yet. Right. But give it six months or a year. Um and go find other people who are coming up with you. And that'll be your class that you come up with, just like school. Yeah. You gotta find your people. You gotta find your people. And you'll all have success together. You know? Yeah. And it's it. You know, I don't know. It's more fun this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and especially when, um, 
you know, we all have moments where it's, it's hard Yeah, and you get dark days and things don't always go your way, but I've always found, you know, a lot of comfort in, in my, my fellow sure. classmates. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause they've been through it too. And we all kind of hit those points at different times. That's right. right. But you gotta, you, when you got a buddy to sort of just go, eh, it's going to be all right. Well, that's the beauty of this community. It's like on your worst day, you've got a right. You don't even want to go. Yep. You, you go, but it's one of your buddies and he lifts you right out of that ditch that you're in. Mm-hmm. Or, and you're going to do the same for somebody else the next day. I mean, yeah. that's just the way it goes. It's so people, I don't think people really understand how um, healthy that is. Yeah. Here. It's like free therapy. Or it's something. like free therapy. <laughs> but it is, um, there is, there's so much magic in it. Um, in just to, today's a, a great example for me personally. I, you know, it was raining, it was dark. I did, mm-hmm. I didn't even want to go to my right today, but I went. And we wrote this great song and we're just, you know, you kind of leave with this feeling of like, well, that might change my life, you know? I mean, (laughs) and you don't know. No. But, but the, that sort of dopamine hit of every day, maybe you could change your life is, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm sure it exists in other jobs, but I'm glad it exists. You know, it's, it's funny. We, we talk about there's, you know, one of the things that's sort of rampant is cancellations. Yeah. And you don't want to be the writer that cancels. Correct. You know, you, you don't want to be that guy or that girl. Yeah. But it's, and, and there are reasons that are legitimate to cancel. Sure. But just because you don't feel like it, can, I mean, can you imagine having a job? You just go, I just don't want to go to my job today. I'm just not going to go. I don't yeah. feel like it. I mean, that's crazy. You have to look at this like it's, you like, you have to show up. You, if you don't show up, Whatever is in the atmosphere just above your head is not going to fall on your head right. for you to write if you don't go in that room when you don't want to. Yeah. It's just the you way have, it is. You have to be present to win. That's right. And it, yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's true in, in the songwriting thing. It's, the tr- it's, it's true in, you know, in playing with, um, you know, I, I tour and like with making bands and stuff too. It's yeah. just sometimes people are just like, oh, I just, I can't make it. And you're like, what? <laughs> We're going out of town. Like, what? Are you, what? Yeah. You know, and it's like, okay, well, I guess that this is just not for you. Yeah. You know, I mean, you gotta, you gotta show up. It's, it's hard. Sometimes yeah. you don't want to, but, um, you know, I, I don't know. I find, I find that those people tend to just not stick around too long. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, and as a publisher too, there are some days where you sort of have pitched everything that you, that's, you know, you're kind of caught up. You find mm. yourself being caught up. Yeah. And I learned early on to just, w- when I feel like that, it's never, th- that's never the truth. Whenever I feel like that, that's me, that's the lazy me showing up and yeah. talking, you know, the, the devil on on this shoulder mm-hmm. saying, just go play golf, just get out of here, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, But I always learned that when you feel that way, do one more thing. Just do one more thing. Yeah. And the times that I just did one more thing and something came of it are a lot. Yeah. I mean, just you just have to, uh, when I, and you know, you talk about work, Liz Rose is a wonderful, like, technical songwriter. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's, she's all heart and she's, she, she can put it together and she just has all the pieces. Yeah. But she will outright outwork you. Okay. She will, put more hours in than anybody I know. She just always did. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, it's the, um, it's the perspiration and the inspiration. Yeah. You know, you've got to do both. Do you, do you think with someone like Liz, does that come, does that working harder than other people, does that come out as she just wrote more songs or was it after, was she pitching more songs? Like, what does that look like? It was, well, Working with her when she, as a as a songwriter, it was work. She, I mean, she wrote three hundred and fifty songs a year. Yeah, so more songs, more songs, like a hundred a hundred more songs than the next writer. Yeah, wow. I mean, just crazy numbers. Yeah, for year after year after year, and you're bound to hit something in there. I mean, yep. just the odds are, are increase every time you do it. Yeah, 
Yeah, it increases the uh, luck surface area. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it's it's you know, I think it's we're in a weird time right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned a lot of it's it's rare for just a just a straight writer to move to town. It's a lot of artist writers or right, and I think it's hard to know now as someone like myself who's an artist and a writer and now you also got all right we're making content today we're we got to post a tiktok we have to do all this stuff so i do i find myself working almost all the time and sometimes i don't know i get tired or burnt out but at the end of the day if i look back at the last few years of my life it got a it got a lot better because i worked harder I had more opportunities and I can't say it was cause I wrote more songs or cause I did more TikToks or, you know, tried to like do my hair better and be a better artist or something. Right. But I think it was just all of it. Well, you're more invested if you work harder. Yeah. And, and you learn something every day that you show up for work. Yeah. So, um, especially in the songwriting area, cause you'll, you'll write with somebody new and you'll go, wow, I never thought about approaching it that way you know um so yeah it's it's not it's it i mean it's it's always been the hardest way to go to make a living (laughs) you know i I tell like like when we started this you know it's like you you um you've picked the hardest way to make a living on planet earth yep and so uh but you also have picked the most fun and exhilarating line of work you can do yeah. I mean and it's and to me I think another another thing you talk about whatever whatever uh good fortune I've had during my career um is is really just attitude. Mm. It's just just waking up every day and and having a really positive attitude that the best things are going to happen and that everything that is not going your way is really a stepping stone to the next thing that's going to go your way. Yeah. I mean you have to because you, because it's you know, it'll this this business will beat you up a little bit, <laughs> beats little all bit. of us up. Yeah, yeah. You too. It's not. It's yeah. not just. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, but I just try to stay on the other, the other side of that. I don't, yeah. I don't get down in the, you know, the chasm of it. Yeah, it just, it's just not worth it. Yeah, because tomorrow, you know, uh, Harper O'Neill or Peyton Porter is going to walk in. And they're going to say, listen to this. And I'm going to go, okay, well, dang. Yeah. This is great. You know, <laughs> this is it. This is it. Yeah. Um, so I always ask people kind of um, like what advice they would give, um, you know, to a fellow songwriter or, or whatever. So um, I guess what I, what I'd like to ask you is if, if somebody wants to get into publishing they want to be mm-hmm. a publisher um how would they what's a good place for them to sort of start looking you know you have to believe in something it, it another interesting thing i figured out about my own career is that and and i have lost my job before mm-hmm. in my career and gone and looked for a job you know midway through my career yeah and I always had a pretty decent reputation, but even at those times when I was knocking on people's doors to get another job and my reputation was good, unless you're, unless you have a piece of business, they don't really need you no matter what kind of a good guy you are. Yeah. You know, you got to have something. So if you want to, if you want to be a publisher, just be one, just wake up that day and say, I'm a publisher and look up the definition of publishing. And basically it's to go find a writer that you believe in and take his music and expose the music to people who can help create an income stream. And then somebody may cut you into a deal and sign the writer at Warner Chapel and you're their point person and you started a little publishing company. Yeah, It's like um, um, Doug Kasmus and David Lee Murphy. You know, there's a good subject. Okay. Get, get Doug Kasmus in here. Okay. I'd love that. <laughs> he uh, he was um, just up until recently, and, and maybe he still is, but, um, you know, all during David Lee Murphy's career, mm-hmm. he, he just decided he was going to be his publisher, and David Lee Murphy said, okay, and he just learned how to be a song plugger and got in plugger groups, and 
Yeah. He worked with me at um at Sound 70 when I worked for Charlie Daniels in the 70s. That's amazing. And they just I think David Lee Murphy just signed with uh Pure. Okay. Um uh but anyway, Doug Casmus is that guy you're talking about. Yeah, that's actually some of I think actually the best advice that we've we've had on here which is like just go do it. Whatever it is, you want to write songs? Okay. You don't need anybody's permission to write no. songs. If you want to manage a band, you don't need anybody's permission. Go find a band and and just say, what do you need? I'll do it. Um, which it's not rocket science, but I don't know. It kind of feels crazy. It, well, it's, it's crazy because you're not, there's no, um, you've got to make your income at the beginning from somewhere else Yeah. when you're doing that. Yeah. So it, it takes, you know, it just takes years sometimes to get to that artist to where they're they're making enough money to justify you doing it full time. Yeah. But if you enjoy it and you really believe in it, I mean, the payoff, I mean, look at, look at the hits that David Lee Murphy's had over 30 something years. Oh my gosh. Incredible. Incredible. They both did really well. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, well, uh, is there, I think we've touched on the advice and your history. Is there anything else that you want people to know about, your company or just about life or anything? Uh, well, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, I'll just, I'll say a little bit about my company. My company, it, we, we have sort of a, a moniker and it's song forward. Yeah. So it's, it's all about um, finding writers who sort of buy into that mindset mm. and, and um, you know, elevating the music, elevating the song quality. And that's very subjective, but we think about it every day, and we we uh, hook up our co-writes thinking about that. Yeah, and um, I'm just really proud of all the people that we've got. It's it's interesting. We have you know Peyton Porter and Harper O'Neill, whose careers are going like this. Andy Austin is in a trio called Old Hickory. Okay. They're going like this, and and they're they're all developing yeah. very nicely. Yeah, nice nice and slow and steady, but trajectory is up yeah on all of them yeah and then on the other hand we've got natalie hemby uh as we we writer manage her we manage her calendar for her yeah she's published by another company called ctm so it's a different type of uh, business arrangement but we have natalie hemby who's very established and vince gill and vince is you know so i've got i've got writers on both ends of the artist spectrum and in different stages of their careers. Yeah. And it is, um, it is so much fun. You know, it's, it's not, it's really not about the number one party. Mm -hmm. It's really about what you did today. I mean, that's really, that's, if I have one thing to, um, to pass along is that the win is today. Like the win for me today is coming here and sit with sitting with you and you asking me these questions. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that was a win. That was like a number one party for me. Yeah. And tomorrow's going to be another one in a different way. So if you have, if your attitude stays light like that, you're inviting good things in, Yeah, you know, you can't help but do it. Wow. It's beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I said something similar when Luke Laird was here. It's like, I can just tell that you love the game. Mm -hmm. you know and uh that passion really shines through and it's it's inspiring to me and i i I think it's inspiring to a lot of people so thank you yeah thank you so thank you so thank you so much for being here yeah man i appreciate it enjoyed it all right thanks that's it that's the pod see you later